From Sarasota Memorial and the Deb Kavanaugh Multimedia Studio, this is HealthCast, a healthy dose of information from experts you can trust. Hi, everybody. Welcome to HealthCast. I'm Allison Gottermeyer. Thank you so much for joining us today as we talk about summer safety tips for parents and families. Our guest today is a registered nurse and trauma injury prevention coordinator at Sarasota Memorial, Casey Howell. Casey, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me. Trauma injury prevention coordinator, that kind of seems to <laughs> encompass a lot of things. It does, it does. It's a little bit. So can big. you just start by explaining what your role is at SMH? Sure. So trauma injury prevention is basically rooted in education. Um, so as a trauma center, we strive to provide the best possible care for anyone in our community with a traumatic injury. However, a lot of accidents, traumatic injuries are potentially preventable, or at least we have the ability to potentially mitigate some of the uh, level of injury when they happen, things like seatbelts and helmets and appropriate car seats for children and things like that can help to reduce the incidence of injury um, uh, when accidents do happen, when they can't be prevented. So a lot of my role is to put some education out there uh, about what your options are, making sure how to wear a properly fitted helmet um, and things to look for in car seats where you, for your age group of child and other things that we can do like that to help prevent some of those injuries. So you just mentioned a couple of things you think of when it comes to summer safety with kids, but what are some of the other things that are top of mind uh, when it comes to safety for kids during the summer? Sure, um, especially being out of school, there's a lot of outdoor activities, a lot of water related sports and, and play. So we worry about water and submersion injuries, um, especially uh, excessive exposure to heat and the sun, especially here in Florida, right? It's real hot out there. Um, and we can have injuries related to that. We worry about those road trips, right? And making sure that your child's appropriately um, restrained in, in a appropriate car seat for them and their age and size, especially we're gonna be on long road trips and things like like that. Bike and pedestrian safety, a lot of bicycle riding, make sure they wear helmets and that they understand the safest ways to ride and, and to obey the laws of the road and ideally riding in groups and uh, things like that. High visibility uh, becomes a big issue with almost any summertime related activity with kids, making sure that they are highly visible um, to others to help avoid injury. One of my favorite things to do in the summer growing up was always taking my bike over to my friend's house. Um, and you mentioned bike safety. So let's start there. Okay. Um, kids do love to head out in the neighborhood, especially in the summer when yeah. they're on vacation, which is great. And we want kids to be active, yes. of course. It's a good thing but we want them to be safe too. So yes. what initial tips do you have for parents? All right, so number one is definitely helmets. Helmets, helmets, helmets. Helmets, bike helmets are the number one way to prevent and reduce head injuries and morbidity mortality from bicycle accidents. So a properly fitting helmet as well. So it should be nice and snug on the top of the head. Ideally, you want it to be level, so not tilted up too far. And I want about one or two fingers between the eyebrow and the bottom part of the actual helmet and it has to be clasped. I know a lot of my like cool tween age kids like to wear the helmet but then leave it undone. Well, that helmet goes flying the second that any type of falling or coming off that bike. So it acts, it really definitely needs to be clipped at the bottom and nice and snug. You want to be able to get one or maybe two fingers between the bottom of the chin. I don't want it so tight that they're having a hard time or uncomfortable, but I want it snug enough that it stays in place. And the straps that come down over the ears usually make like a V type shape there before it comes to to one strap at the chin, so we want to make sure those are adjusted to be right at the bottom or just in front of the bottom of the ear. That's what's going to give a, a good proper fit of a bike helmet. So that's definitely A number one. Then again, high visibility, making sure they're wearing colors that are easily seen, avoiding riding at dusk and dawn when it's too dark outside, um, riding um, sidewalks when they're able to be utilized safely and appropriately. We don't want to interfere with pedestrian traffic. Um, and to follow the rules of, of the road as well to make sure that we're crossing the road at a place where it can be expected and anticipated by drivers. And if they can ride in groups, that's always better, right? Safety in numbers. So if you're, they're riding with their friends or family, usually there's going to be an increased level of safety there as well. Do you recommend to parents um, 
always being with the kids when they're on their bikes? Or, or when, are, when is it okay for parents to let the kids take the bikes on their own? That is an excellent question and a very individualized one. Ideally, sure, we're all safer when we have an additional person or rider with us. So yeah, especially when your child is younger, they've just really gotten steady on that bike, um, especially if you have any concern that they might get turned around or, or not make appropriate sound judgment calls, you know, narrow the road, then always they should be supervised. Once they get a little bit older, I think that'll be a little more parent and child specific and dependent. But the best way to kind of gauge when your child is ready is to ride with them, you know, up until that point so that you can judge their ability to make good decisions and stay safe on the road. Speaking of roads, you did mention those long car trips, mm -hmm. family vacation, traveling, whatever it may be, car trips, which are a lot of fun for the family right. in many ways. But let's talk about car seats, because I know this is so important with children. What are the most important things you tell parents about car seats? Oh, there's a lot of really important things about car seats. And then, it, so the things that are gonna be most applicable to your child or your family will have a lot to do on the age and size of your child. Um, so if we're talking about infants and young toddlers, rear facing car seats, um, the law, in our state versus the recommended safety standard by the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, don't match up quite well. So legally, you can theoretically turn your child to be front facing after one year of age. However, we don't recommend that. Um, I, at least a minimum of two years of age. But ideally, I wanna keep that small child rear facing till they reach the max height and weight recommendation for rear facing of the manufacturer of the car seat. So every car seat will have its own spe specifics about rear facing, forward facing, um, things like, especially in convertible car seats that are meant to do both. The bucket style is intended for very young infants um, and they usually outgrow that with, uh, within the first year. And then we recommend that convertible where you can start out rear facing and then turn it around when they out outgrow the rear facing um, dimensions there. So making sure, checking on the side, there's a sticker on the side of that car seat, making sure that your child's within the appropriate height and weight recommendations for that seat in the position that they're in. And it's so important the car seat is installed correctly. Um, how can you make sure your car seat is in right? So this is, this is tricky. Um, I, I will tell you that uh, three out of four car seats are often installed improperly, which is a huge number. Um, and we think, you know, like we're smart individuals, I can put in a car seat. Um, all of the installation recommendations differ per seat manufacturer and also per vehicle manufacturer. And there has to be the perfect happy medium to meet both of those. So it does include checking with your, your vehicle manual um, that comes with the specific vehicle you're putting the seat in, the specific seat and manufacturer of that. Um, um, and again, which direction is gonna be appropriate uh, for your child. Um, having it checked by a CPST or child passenger safety technician um, is always gonna be your ideal best bet. Um, so that's our job to not only check to make sure that your seat's installed properly, but to teach you what, we what it is specifically we're looking for um, and how to ensure that it's installed properly every time. Because it's not unreasonable to have to take a seat out occasionally and reinstall it or you know, riding with grandma or you know, coming home with another family, you know, getting picked up after camp or something like that. So we want to make sure that everybody knows how to get them in properly every time. Um, and so there, there are definitely things that uh, we look for, but consulting the manual that's specific to the, to the car seat and making sure that it's compatible with your vehicle. Sometimes there is an actual incompatibility issue. So we have to make sure that that's going to properly work in every case. And you talked about the importance of rear facing. As a mom with a baby who's currently rear facing, there are a lot of, um, Mis misinformation pieces out there mm -hmm. saying that like if your child's feet are touching the seat when they're rear facing, they need to be turned around. And, and that's not correct. It is height and weight, right? Correct height and weight of the actual specific seat. And that, that is a big concern for a lot of moms, parents, caregivers that they're like, well, they're, they're, they're really tall or they're, they're, their legs are folded up and crunched up in the back and it looks uncomfortable. And, and I understand that. 
but when we're looking at crash dynamics, right? So in order of prioritization of injury, when we turn them forward, we're significantly increasing the risk of head and neck injury in a front end collision. All right, so when they're rear facing, even if their legs are crunched up in the back there, or they're folded or something like that, the injury um, potential then shifts down to the legs. If I'm going, if I can't avoid the crash, right, and accidents happen, if I'm looking to protect my child the best that I can, I'm gonna prioritize protecting the head and neck over the leg. I'd rather, I'd rather try to heal a leg injury than a head injury, right, on anyone, but especially a small child. And something that's more recent is, is there have been a lot of reports in recent months about fake car yeah. seats or imitation car seats. seats. How can parents spot a counterfeit? What are, what are, and why are they so concerning? Sure, so there's, and they get tricky, right? Some of them are really good looking counterfeits and uh, you can be, can be tricked with that. So there's a few things that you wanted to take a look for. And the reason that we're looking so much is that we wanna make sure all of the seats are tested to the same safety and efficacy standards, that they're meeting the requirements, um, that the materials used are strong enough to do the job that they need to do with high impact crash forces and that they're designed um, to keep our children as safe as possible. So some of the things that we're gonna look for here in the US, especially um, a five point harness with a chest clip. Um, so a lot of uh, counterfeit imitation seats or seats produced um, elsewhere being kind of slid under the rug as something else uh, oftentimes may have uh, be lacking the chest clip, right? Or look like a five point harness over each shoulder and then connect down at in, in the middle of the legs and then on either side, but it's missing that chest clip. So uh, most of your legitimate car seats are going to have a chest piece um, that should clip in the middle as well. Um, they should all have manufacturer stickers on the actual base of the car seat itself. Um, and those always by law, by federal re regulation, need to have the manufactured date, an expiration date, and a contact number, uh, like an 800 number or way to contact the manufacturer. It should also have listed those height and weight um, max requirements for forward or rear facing, depending on what type of seat we're looking at. Um, so you should be able to, to garner a lot of information about that seat off of those labels specifically. Um, and looking when we're purchasing online, which I do a lot of myself, so I, I get it. And um, it's very convenient, but to look at making sure that we're not getting rerouted to a third party distributor, that you're buying from a reputable distributor. The best way to ensure this is to shop in person for those things, but when you can't, take a look um, like Amazon or Walmart or something if you're on one of those essentially trusted sites. The, a lot of times in the description it might tell you that it's being shipped or, or that the transaction's being completed through another third party seller. Sometimes that can be a red flag. And ultimately, if it looks too good to be true, if that's a $500 car seat and you're gonna get it for 120, you should question the authenticity of the seat there. If it looks too good to be true, it probably is. All right, that's a good point. And you also mentioned that whether it's here at home in Florida or on summer vacation, this often means time in the water, whether it's at the beach or the pool or whatever it is. What do you focus on most when it comes to trauma prevention with water? So like most things, prevention is key. And when we're talking about kids in dangerous potential environments and situations, um, supervision, supervision, supervision. And this can be tricky with water. There, there can be instances where there's a few kids in the water at, it's a backyard barbecue, it's a pool party, it's a, it's a summer uh, Independence Day celebration, and there are 20 or 30 adults around, right? All those parents are there, so there's this level of built-in assumed safety, that there's tons of adults, there's tons of supervision, so everything's good. Um, and that's not always the case, especially because drowning events in children are not as dramatic appearing as like on TV or in movies. This is not thrashing, yelling, screaming, shouting. Kids are happy when they're playing and they don't wanna stop playing, especially for something like just being tired. They will go and go and go until they exert all their energy. So submersion or drowning events in kids often look like that kid plays as hard as they can until they're too tired to stay above the water and they can silently slip under the water and it go unnoticed essentially 
locally. So making sure that we have a designated water watcher. That means a specific adult who understands that they have been identified as that that is their job at all, uh, all times to keep eyes on the water. Um, and it doesn't mean that obviously we can pass that job off, right? So for 20, 30 minutes, I'm the water watcher and then we're passing that off, but communicating with all the other adults in the area, making sure that we have someone whose sole purpose, right, during that period of time is to watch the water and keep the kids in there safe. What are the must-haves for kids and water safety aside from that water watcher? Sure, uh, and this will be a little bit dependent as well on the child, their age, their how well they swim, their comfortability in the water and things like that. Um, so making sure that they have whatever type of appropriate apparatus they might need, especially if they're not really strong swimmers yet, um, but that good supervision um, and visibility. Again, like I said, with a lot of things, especially with kids, visibility is really important. Um, so if you're looking to invest in new swimsuits, uh, this this season, especially for your kiddos, color matters. Color matters. Bright neon colors actually are the easiest to see underwater, especially when the surface tension has been disrupted. So there's other kids and they're playing, so it's not a smooth like plane of glass water. The water is a little bit disrupted, so that bright green, yellow, orange, pink, those neons really um, are much more visible, especially avoiding blues and light blues and even the darker colors in a disrupted surface um, tension of the water. Those can be difficult to, to identify. Something that also goes hand in hand with water safety is sunscreen, especially yes. here in Florida. We know we need it all year round. <laughs> yes. um, because sun protection is so important, how should parents choose a good sunscreen for their children? Because it's not the same sunscreen they might use for themselves. Correct, it might not be, uh, although, they should consider using the same sunscreen for themselves. Everybody, everybody, according to the American Academy of Dermatology, that should use a broad spectrum SPF of th at least 30. So a UVA and UVB blocking um, sunscreen with an SPF of at least 30 um, gives a good broad general coverage against harmful sun rays that can cause cancer. And it's about reapplying. So every two hours is the recommendation and or as soon as they come out of the water or head heavy sweating or they've you know gotten wet at some point reapply reapply there's no such thing as a true waterproof sunscreen there's water resistant um, and some might stick on a little bit better than others but we should be applying at least every uh, reapplying every two hours and after those water activities um, but a broad spectrum with at least 30 SPF is what's recommended for all skin tones and all ages greater than six months Something you see or hear about a lot as well is combination sunscreen and bug spray, uh, especially in Florida where we do have those buggy yeah. evenings. What is the recommendation on that with children? Very, be very cautious with that. It's best to avoid that, especially in small kids. The because this the combination, the concentration of both of those um, components there is that dose of bug repellent, especially depending on what type of repellent it's using, but maybe a DEET based product, um, is a appropriate dose for a one-time application of that sunscreen. And I just told you that we need to reapply the sunscreen for it to be most effective every two hours. So then you're reapplying potentially uh, higher doses than you would like of the bug repellent as well. And that's absorbed topically through the skin. So that ends up kind of that potentially has the ability to add up to a lot of excess chemicals that you might not necessarily want to be applying. So pur purchase those things separately um, and reapply those as needed. But it does happen, especially here in Florida, kids get the sunburn anyway. So if they get a sunburn, how should kids' sunburns be treated? Sure. Essentially the same way that we're going to treat adults as well. Kind of a, a general um, recommendation that one, prevention is key. So always kind of, you know, hats, sunglasses, protective clothing, sunscreen and reapplying. But when those accidents do happen, then avoid the heat until the, heel ha uh, the burn has healed, right? We don't want to keep exposing or increasing warm temperatures. As soon as you recognize that there might be a burn happening, we want to seek shade, get them out of the direct sunlight, help them start to try to cool off, tepid baths, um, and then moisturizing at when you get out of the water, help retaining some skin moisture. That would be very helpful. Aloe, a good quality aloe vera product can be really nice uh, for skin burns. Really good hydration. 
uh, burns. Not only are we playing out in the sun and we're sweating a lot and it's hot and we need to be mindful of that, but once a burn has happened, it then takes a toll again on your, your fluid volume status. So making sure that we keep those people really, really well hydrated. Um, and we can use ibuprofen or something in the EDSED family to help reduce inflammation and increase comfort um, and avoiding a secondary injury or reburn on top of that while it's healing is really important. Another risk, especially in the dog days of summer mm -hmm. is that heat stroke mm -hmm. as well. So hydration is important there, but what are some initial signs that heat, heat stroke might be happening in children? Sure, so we'll, we go through kind of phases when with heat related injuries, we'll hit heat exhaustion first uh, and then kind of progress into heat stroke if it goes untreated at that point. So when we're talking, we would like to pick up on it as early as possible. Prevention again, always key. So trying to avoid being doing the most strenuous type of activity in the hottest part of the day that late afternoon should be avoided. Um, that's gonna be kind of your highest risk factor time, making sure that we're keeping them well hydrated and protected from the sun as best as possible with again that sunscreen and protective clothing but when we do start to experience heat exhaustion issues um, you might see excessive thirst excessive sweating um, could get muscle cramps leading into tiredness or lethargy uh, exhaustion um, could even start to get little moments of waxing and waning level of consciousness um, and this is when they have like potentially cool clammy skin right cool Cool, clammy skin in anybody but especially a kid in the middle of summer out in the middle of the day that's a that's definitely a big big warning sign uh, so we want to immediately get them out of the heat go find shade get into a cool place reduce layers of clothing get them in that tepid water tepid bath or put cool cloths on their skin to help kind of let that evaporation cooling effect take place and um, if it's safe to do so if they are awake enough right to cool sips of water or uh, any type of electrolyte replacement would be okay. Um, sometimes that can progress that heat exhaustion, start vomiting, get nauseous and vomiting. All right. So if they're still vomiting, then I don't want to give them anything to drink at that point. But when does it reach the point that parents need to seek medical care for that heat exhaustion? Sure. So anytime that there's a concern for heat exhaustion, we, we need to react promptly, right? And start bringing that kid inside, taking a look at them, see if we can. And if they don't respond, pretty quickly to cool water, cooling down, get the color back in, um, you know, and have a appropriate kind of demeanor for that child, then they should seek medical help. If we were unable to catch it early in that exhaustion phase, and there's a concern that that has progressed into heat stroke, fainting, seizures, loss of consciousness, uh, uncontrolled vomiting, when they stop sweating, they should be sweating out in the summer heat, right? So when they are dry, red, and flushed, all right, and potential have body, core body temperatures reaching upwards of 105, that requires immediate emergent medical treatment. We've discussed a number of topics here that are all really important when it comes to kids' summer safety. What is your number one message to parents or your summary message to parents when it comes to enjoying the summer while also doing it so safely. Right. It's all about prevention, 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 putting as many things in place with planning um, and being mindful of those activities and what the specific risks are for going boating. A, a, a life jacket is an absolute must, even for your strongest swimmers. If you're heading to the beach, making sure that you have that sunscreen and enough of it to get through the day and an umbrella or some form of shade that you can use right in a pinch when you need to. Um, and making sure that again, you have that water watching person designated to, to watch them at all times, swimming in designated areas. If you're at the beach in front of a lifeguard stand, being familiar with the warning flags, we always want to look for green and yellow flags, purple is an immediate get out of the water, red flags uh, might indicate that there's strong undertow or currents and could be dangerous, especially for weaker swimmers or small children. So preparation, education, planning, good hydration, good sunscreen, and whatever type of safety measure is going to be most appropriate for that activity. Bike helmets, life jackets when boating, um, all of those type of things that we talked about, making sure that the car seat has a good install and is in the appropriate um, riding conditions for that age child, especially when you're going to be on the road for a good long time. So planning, preparation, and putting as many safety measures in advance in place and making sure your child gets used to that, that that is the standard for them, that they are accustomed to and seeking out those safety measures so it becomes the norm. 
Casey Howell, thank you so much for all of this information to help us have a fun and safe summer for My our pleasure. families. As always, we encourage everyone in our community to visit smh.com to get the latest from Sarasota Memorial. Have a great day. Thank you.